I want to uh, talk uh, this morning uh, about uh, faith. Uh, this is uh, perhaps one of the things that got me started thinking in terms of urban legends about God, the Bible, and Christian faith, because I found not only did I encounter this idea from people outside of the church, beyond, you know, outside of the, uh, of the faith, I guess you could say, but I also heard it a lot as I uh, wandered around, uh, wandered out there in the world, and um, I remember having, a, and I've talked about him a lot, because, you know, it's always, uh, it's always good to, to have, uh, have, have real atheists to, to kind of run up against and see what they say, and um, David Walker, my, my friend David, and uh, he, uh, he gave a two-night series on the campus uh, on why I don't believe in God. Well, fair enough, you know, why I don't believe in God. And the first night, he, uh, he basically made the point, the argument there was, Christianity is irrational. Christianity doesn't offer reasons. And he told a story about going up to some, uh, to some professor who knew, other fellow professor who knew that he was about to do the series and uh, apparently who counted himself as a Christian and said, oh, I don't know why you're doing this. And, and so David challenged him and said, uh, challenged him and said, why do you, you know, well, why do you believe in Christianity? What's your, what's your arguments for Christianity? What's your best one? He said, oh, I don't have to defend God. I don't have to give reasons. I, I just have faith. And so he kind of talked about that the first night, and then the second night, he, he ran through all the usual arguments about, you know, there's no God, and, and Christians use this argument from the first cause, you know, God is the first cause uncaused, and, and they use the design argument, and then there's this problem with suffering, and so he just ran through all, all those kind of arguments. And so after that second night, I, I walked with him across the campus to his office, and I said, now, David, I'm just a little confused here. Now, is it the case that Christians don't offer any reasons? That's the first night's lecture. Or is it the case that, that the, the reasons that Christians offer just aren't any good? You've got to make up your mind here. He did not get it at all. He did not see what I saw at all. The first night, Christ, the problem with Christianity is that it doesn't offer reasons. The second night, Christianity offers these reasons and they're all dumb. You've got to make a choice there. And I think the way that he thought about faith and the way that he thought about religion and what Christians do and what Christians believe is, uh, is, is often not only, not only out there in the world, but it's also in the church. And, and so really, I don't know if we can blame the atheists for having that view that faith is just a blind leap in the dark. Faith is believing in something for no good reason. In fact, let me uh, show you what's out there. Here's uh, Webster's New World College Dictionary. Now, this is a an American publication, and you have to understand that the way that dictionaries work, dictionaries don't tell you uh, what, a, what a word should mean. They tell you what it what it, how it is being used, right? So if they're not, they're not prescriptive, they're descriptive. I don't know if you don't understand, it's all right. Uh, it's all right. But the point is, is that the, the dictionary reflects the opinion of the editorial board about what those words will mean to their target audience. So here's the target audience for this dictionary are American university students, right? And college is American for, for universities, right? So, here's the number one definition, and the way that dictionaries work is that the number one def uh, definition is supposed to describe the most prominent way the word is used, the dominant way. So, number one, an unquestioning belief that does not require proof or evidence. That's the definition of faith. An unquestioning belief that does not require proof or evidence. Number two, unquestioning belief in God, religious tenets, etc., Here's another one. Uh, a strong belief, this is from OxfordDictionaries.com, so they go online, so this is probably a dictionary that's more aimed at a uh, Anglo, English, you know, uh, UK English kind of audience. Uh, so here the second definition is a strong belief in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual conviction rather than proof. Why do you believe? I don't know. I just believe that kind of thing, right? So, when skeptics attack Christianity, this is the definition of faith that they're working, uh, working with. Let me give you another couple of, uh, of uh, the ways that this word has been used. So here's Richard Dawkins, uh, big, big atheist guy. 
Uh, so he says, faith being believed, uh, sorry, faith being believed that isn't based on evidence is the principal vice of any religion. So it's a vice. So that's kind of like what my, what my friend David Walker was saying, you know, is that here's the problem with Christianity is that you don't have any reasons for believing what you believe. And so that is not a virtue, but that is vice. Faith is a vice, not a virtue. Here's Sam Harris. Wrote a book called The End of Faith. And by the way, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, Christopher Hitchens, these various uh, various guys are a part of what, what are called the new atheists. You know, a more, a more kind of foaming at the mouth, more aggressive kind of atheists uh, that we've seen in the last several years. So Sam Harris wrote, uh, Every religion preaches the truth of propositions for which no evidence is even conceivable. This put the leap in Kierkegaard's leap of faith. And I like that little quote there from Sam Harris because I think he put his finger on it. If we're going to blame somebody for why we have this idea that faith is believing in something for no good reason, then dear old Soren Kierkegaard is the guy that we should blame. So let me give, give you a, a bit of background about Kierkegaard. He's a Danish, he was a Danish philosopher and theologian. He lived at a time where the, the state of Denmark, the nation of Denmark, had its own official church. So you have the Church of Denmark. And uh, everybody who's born in Denmark is going to be baptized as a little baby into the Church of Denmark. So if you are Danish, you are a Den Church of Denmarkian, you know, whatever that is, right? Probably Lutheran, Lutheran uh, background perhaps to that, I'm not quite sure. Uh, what the, what their specific doctrinal position was, but but basically everyone had a state uh, was part of the state religion. Just being born there made you a Christian, and this made Kierkegaard think: What would make the difference between someone who was a Christian by accident of birth, because of the family they happened to be born in, or because of the country they happened to be born in, and someone who was a Christian because they genuinely wanted to be? A Christian. In other words, what really makes a genuine, authentic Christian? So that's, you know, the first problem that, that he ran into, the first kind of question that he asked. He also began to wonder whether simply knowing enough stuff about Christianity was ever going to be enough to constitute genuine Christian faith. And, and by the way, I'll come, maybe come back to that point toward the end. I think maybe he's... Uh, it's kind of got a, got a point here. I mean, when you think about it, how, how sympathetic we might be, is, is being born uh, in a nation that is predominantly Christian, is that enough to make you a Christian? If, if I can intellectually uh, tell you on, on an intellectual level, yes, there was Jesus, Jesus lived in the first century, uh, he was a Jew, uh, he claimed to be Christ, uh, perhaps he was Christ, and uh, you know he died, and he was buried, and he was raised again, and he started off a new movement, and we call that the movement Christianity. You know, the, we can make the intellectual assent to all of these claims, and we could know a lot about Christianity. We could maybe be memorize lots of the Bible and be able to spout off the Bible just from from the memory that we have. But is that enough to make you? A Christian. And, and of course he answered the negative in both things, senses. Authentic faith, authentic faith cannot be enough, cannot be an accident of birth, and authentic faith cannot depend merely on what you know. It's got to be, surely it's got to be something more to faith than, uh, than simply knowing enough or simply being born in the right spot. But at the same time, Faith seemed so incredibly real to Kierkegaard. He acknowledged that there were people there who had, who had their lives transformed by faith. He, he, he knew, he would have known about those who were former slave traders, who had realized what a terrible thing this slave uh, industry was, and, and had found God, as it were, and completely turned their lives around and were now committed to getting rid of slavery altogether. Just, he, he saw examples like that where definitely there were people who had an experience of faith in their lives who, who really, this was something real for them, something genuine, something authentic, and he thought, there's got to be, there's got to be something more to it than that. But he still thought that just knowing stuff wasn't enough. 
Because the other thing about Kierkegaard's time is he lived in a time uh, where it, he wasn't living too long after a man, a Scottish philosopher by the name of David Hume, had published his uh, you know, big volume showing why God doesn't exist, all these reasons why God doesn't exist. Uh, he lived just within a short space of time from uh, another guy called Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T. Uh, Immanuel Kant, who was another philosopher, who even though he seemed to believe in God, didn't think there were any good reasons, any good arguments for God's existence. And so Kierkegaard thought, look, we've just got too much, too much to fight against. The headwinds blowing against Christians and their faith are just too much. Who am I? Uh, as, as an average Christian, to, to think that I could ever go against the giant mind of someone like David Hume, or the, the in, in, incredible intelligence of someone like Immanuel Kant, how could I possibly think that I could know enough, or I could have good enough reasons to, to refute those kind of guys? You know, in other words, how could the average Christian ever think that he knows enough to be a Christian? And so, maybe there's... There's another way to think about faith. That faith is real, but there's some other way to get to it. And so Kierkegaard came to the conclusion that knowledge and the life of faith that Christians experience were two entirely different things. You can have knowledge and you can have faith. But there's no way that you can simply get uh, uh, from one to the other. You can't simply pile up the facts and, um, sorry, can't simply pile up the facts and, uh, and be able to get to faith. You can't build a, uh, a, a bridge, as it were. You can't, you can't build a causeway from knowledge. You can say, well, if I keep knowing more, if I keep building up all the knowledge that I have, then eventually I can get to the point where I can have genuine faith. Kierkegaard didn't think that you could have that. He didn't think that you could have fa facts and faith, and, uh, sorry, facts and knowledge and logic and be able to get from there, from knowledge, to faith. Despite the fact that Kierkegaard wrote in Danish, you know, no one speaks Danish. <laughs> so, um, you know, so people in Denmark. So, despite the fact that he wrote in Danish, Despite the fact that, that he was always a tough read, even apparently uh, those people who are fluent in Danish have a hard time reading Kierkegaard. So, you know, so even though you've got that issue and, uh, and you've got to find a good translation, even though you've got all those problems, the idea that he put across about faith won a lot of hearts. It, it proved to be a very popular idea. Uh, it was accepted by so many theologians and Christian philosophers of his time and others that came after. And, and in the face of science and in the, the powerful philosophical obje objections to religion, you think about in 1859, you've got Charles Darwin and The Origin of Species being published. You've got the constant drumbeat against faith. The Bible is not true. Nothing in the Bible is right. All these things, there's no evidence for anything that we read about in the Bible. This was the German critics. Right? Everything, everything we simply assume that anything you read in the Bible is wrong, unless you can prove otherwise. Think about it. We never approach that, never approach any other ancient book like that. But yeah, with the Bible, assume that everything is wrong unless you can prove otherwise. What do you do in the face of so much doubt, in the face of so much critics criticism that is coming your way. So <coughs> faith is believing regardless of pretty much anything else. I believe and that's all you need to know. In fact, it's reached the point where people want to say this, you show me your weak, passionless faith with your fancy pants arguments and your reasons, and I'll show you my simple trusting faith without them. My faith without reasons is better than your faith with reasons. And so from the dictionaries, to the atheists, to Kierkegaard, to, to Christian theologians, to the way that I hear even my brothers and sisters in Christ talk about faith, this is the notion of faith that we're dealing with today. You may never have heard Kierkegaard, uh, but uh, let alone spell his name. You know, don't forget the little cross through the O thing. But anyway, you know, can't spell his name. That doesn't matter. This is the dominant idea of religious faith that's in circulation today. 
And of course the thing is, is that this is not biblical faith. I just think Kierkegaard had the wrong image of faith, the wrong metaphor for faith. You know, his, his metaphor of faith, his, his image, his picture of faith was, uh, you know, imagine that there's this huge gulf between knowledge and faith and there's no way to, to, to really know that God exists. So you just kind of have to leap in his direction. It's a blind leap in the dark. You don't really know, but you just leap in that direction and hope he's there to catch you on the other side. And that's the, that's the image, that's the, the metaphor of faith that he was going for. I, I want to... Um, Perhaps there's lots of different ways to picture faith, and I'm not the the picture that I'm going to give you here this morning. Well, you may have a different idea about how this should go, but but here's here's how I think of it. I think of it about bookings. Here's my picture of faith. It's a pair of bookings. There's a beginning point to faith, and there's an ending point to faith. The beginning of faith is hearing the case for Christianity with an open mind. You've got to start somewhere, and that start is to openly and fairly consider the case for Christ. Look at what Paul wrote to the Romans. <laughs> so that's hearing faith. So let me go to this passage here. Romans chapter 10, verses 14, and we'll skip down to verse 17. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? In 17, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith begins with someone preaching, and then you hear. And when you hear, you may not accept it, you may not believe it, but that's at least the beginning of it, right? So you've got to hear it. You've got to start somewhere. You've got to be uh, in a position, and we talked a little bit about this uh, at camp, but put yourself in a position where you're willing to listen to the case for Christian faith. That's the point where it begins. It begins with hearing. And then a bunch of other stuff starts perhaps to fall in place. So perhaps uh, you think about uh, hearing, and then, uh, and then perhaps you come to a belief there might even be fears that are involved. All sorts of reasons why people choose ultimately to put on Christ in baptism. Sometimes we might think, we might question people's intentions, question people's motives. We might think about fear. We might think, is, is, is fear the wrong reason to become a Christian? No, you're right to fear the one who can destroy both body and soul, right? You're, you're right to fear that. There are certain fears. And, and look, people may have different motivations. Some people may be, may be motivated to come to Christ because just a, just a, a, a deep sense that, that they need help from God. They need that forgiveness. There may be those who have a, a deep sense of, of love for God. They love God. They love Christ so much that they simply want to give their lives to Christ. There may be those who fear going to heaven tomorrow, where are they going to be, what's going to happen, even on the road home from, you know, God forbid, literally, you know, but if something happened on the way from, from worship uh, to today, and, and I wasn't ready to meet God, what could I? And so there's all sorts of different intentions and different motivations and, and so on that people might have, but fear might be one of them, love might be another one, compassion may be another reason. So there are emotional factors that are involved in our coming to Christ as well. And then there might be more hearing, right? More teaching, more beliefs. And then there are hopes that we might have. As we begin to know more, we begin to realize what waits for us. That hope in what we don't see right here. That hope in something that is invisible to us. And that is eternal life with God in heaven. So there is a beginning point to faith. There is an end point to faith. There is a certain point where... Faith is fulfilled. Faith is revealed. I'm glad we had the scripture read this morning. Uh, but we'll look at this. First of all, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Now I know there's different interpretations about how to, how to look at this verse, but I, I can't help but see it in the context of 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul is basically telling off the Corinthian church, like, <clears throat> excuse me, you guys are are focusing so much on your tongues and your and these miraculous gifts that you're exercising. <coughs> Excuse me, you're trying to you're trying to make 
You're trying to make yourselves better than all the others. Look at what I can do. Look at the, look at the gifts that I have. When really, the greatest gift is this love that you should have for one another, right? So, and there's a sense that, that yeah, in this life, this is the kind of things that might matter, but, but ultimately, what matters is love. Love is the thing that's going to last forever. Faith and hope are, are also just really just for now. You have faith now. You have hope now. But when you get to heaven, why do you need faith anymore? Right? Why, why do you need faith? It's, it's now fulfilled. It's now being realized. Why do you need hope anymore? You don't need hope in heaven. Hope's, you know, you've got it. You've got everything you've hoped for. And so there is an end point to faith. There is a point where you get everything that you have wanted. You get everything that God has promised and you're there. So there is a bookend type of thing to faith. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There's like 15 different ways to translate this. Almost every Bible you pick up has a different, a different rendition of this. Uh, the the uh, New Revised Standard, the Revised Standard, the English Standard uh, use the word assurance. Uh, NIV uses confidence, substance, being sure, um, and so on. Just all sorts of different, different words that I use there. But actually, in the New King James Version, I love the footnotes in the New King James Version, has a footnote for assurance. Has a footnote, the realization. Now, faith is the realization of things hoped for. Faith makes hope real. Right? Faith makes hope real. Maybe, maybe one of the, the reasons that people really get hung up on what faith is is, uh, you know, is a passage like this, you know, where it goes on and the, and the second part of it is just another way of saying the same thing, right? Different words, same thing. The conviction of things not seen. I think uh, the, the legal term conviction is appropriate here. Uh, that's why other translations talk about the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. So what's the point here? Surely the point is that if I am living out my faith, and, and think again about the background to the book of Hebrews, those guys, uh, those Christians of a Jewish background that the writer of Hebrews is addressing in that book are really struggling with their faith. In fact, they're thinking about leaving. They're thinking about going back to their Jewish faith. And so the writer of Hebrews is just appealing to them to stick with it. You know, you have... In Christ, you have a better high priest. You have a, a better sacrifice. You, you have something so much better with Christ. You need to stick with it. And so he gets to Hebrews chapter 11 and he, and he puts out a, a couple of different uh, varieties, a couple of different ways of looking at what faith is. And then what does he do? He goes on to give us, a, as we call it, the roll call of faith. Here are all these different ways in which people manifested faith in their lives. All these different ways in which they acted on the things that they believed. That's faith. They acted on the things that they believed. They made it real. You think about how could salvation for Noah and his family through the ark, how could that ever come to anything if he just said, well, I just believe and just went on with his business? No, he had to actually build the ark to do it. He actually had to trust God. And by the way, trust is just a perfectly good synonym for faith. But he had to trust God that this was right. He had to uh, build that ark. He actually, actually had, to, had to go through that process, get on the ark with his family, and then make it through to the other end, believing and acting on what he believed to be true. He made the salvation of his family real by building that ark and getting on it. So making, making our hope real. Faith is making our hope real. That's the evidence of things not seen. You know, when, when we're in this life, we don't see heaven. We don't see God. We don't see all these different things. But we have the evidence for that. Our life is the evidence for things that we don't see. We're making that in our lives. It's, it's, it's what we're doing. We can't see the Father on His throne. We can't see the Son sitting on His right hand. We can't see the angels praising Him for eternity. We can't see any of that. But we have evidence. When we acknowledge 
that Christ is who he says he was. When Jesus says, uh, you know, that he's the Christ, when he acknowledges that he's the Son of God, when we see all that evidence for what we confess in our lives, for, for what is part of our faith, what is the Christian faith? To, to believe all those things, to acknowledge all those things, to believe all those things. When we make that part of our Christian walk, then we make what comes next a reality. We, we prove ourselves. We prove that all of that is the case. We've come a long way this morning. We've come through these things that are said about faith. Talking about Kierkegaard and all, the, all, all that kind of stuff. But the idea that faith is believing in something for no good reason just looks totally foreign to me when I look at what the scripture says about faith. It is foreign because it is not and never has been part of what God ever expected us to believe or to do. Whatever else that other kind of faith might be, that, that blind leap in the dark, that jump in the dark, or whatever that is, whatever that might be, it is not biblical faith. Faith is very simply trust. It is not a blind trust. It is not a blind leap. It is based on what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And based on what He has done, we have the confidence, the evidence to know that our hopes can become real if only we will trust in Him. And you know what? I still think that there are parts of our lives, part of the way, part of our language, if, if you will, in English at least, where where the word trust and faith still, the, the word faith still has that meaning. I think, for instance, about, I think, for instance, about a, a, son, a, a father and son, and the father's about to wish his son well, and, and they're outside, and, and he's got his, got his car all, all packed up, you know, his old rusty Toyota, or whatever it is, all packed up with stuff, and he's, uh, you know, he's 18 years old, and he's getting ready to go to university, he's moving away from home, and his dad comes up to him, and the last thing he says to his son is, Son, I have faith in you. What does that mean? When we use that word faith in that context like that, what are, what are we trying to say there? Is it because the father says, well, I have no idea. This, this kid's crazy. I have no idea what he's going to do. He could do anything at all. I have no idea. Why would he say then that I have faith in you? Seriously and genuinely. Surely it's because... His son has grown and matured and got to a point where, where he's just, he's proven himself. He's made some hard choices. He's made some mistakes and learned from them and he's, he's made some of those hard choices. But he's shown himself, shown himself to be the kind of man that, that, he's, that his father really wanted him to be. And so he wishes him well, not on the basis of some misplaced trust, but because of what he's seen his son do over the last 18 years. And he wishes him, well, I have faith in you because of that. And, and if you were to put the word trust in there, I have trust in you, wouldn't that be the same thing? Isn't that just using the word in the same way? So there is still small, tiny pockets of our, of our postmodern language uh, the kind of words that we use today where we still we still find a, a place for faith as trust. We still find a place to use that in our language today. And I'm glad we still have a little bit of that left. But somehow when we get to Christianity, we start using faith. Faith is believing for no good reason. Faith is believing what, believing what you know ain't so. Faith is a blind leap in the dark. That's not faith. That's not biblical faith. That's a kind of faith that's a worldly faith. Um, I don't even know what it is. But it's not biblical faith. I think that's the most important point. This morning, we're going to have a song, and I don't know what the tradition here is in Central North, but, but I want to lay that out there. There is a faith. There is, there is something that we can know about Christ, that He is our Savior. I... I would love for you to begin that journey of your faith 
by hearing the gospel. I'm not going to give it up to all this morning because we need to get done, but but that journey can begin with hearing. And you can you can hear about Christ and you can hear about what he did and you can hear about who he was and you can hear about what he wanted for us and that he, he wanted us to be saved. He wanted he didn't want us to to to, to wander around and and uh, and just drown in a sea of sin. He wants to pull us out of it. He has so much available to us if we just if we just take advantage of it, if we just agree to do it. That's all that's all that's out there. And he's told us that that uh, if you want to be a disciple of his, a disciple is simply a follower. If you want to be a follower of his, then you can follow him all the way to heaven. In fact, that's what we read in Acts chapter one when when the disciples are witnessing, the, the apostles are, are witnessing the ascension of Jesus Christ, and they're going, Jesus, you're leaving us again. And they say, no, you're going to follow him in exactly the same way that he went. So he has that example for us. He said in another place, he said, I want you uh, to, to stay here and work here. I'm, I've got to go on. There's many rooms or many mansions that I am preparing for you. So he's going on. We follow him. How do we be that follower? How do we be that disciple? By following his teaching, by following the teaching of those witnesses, those apostles that he left behind for us. Follow them. Look at what they had to say. And he said right there at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, he said to his disciples, I want you to go out into the world and I want you to share this faith that you have. I want you to be witnesses to what you've seen. And I want you to baptize anybody who believes what I am, who I am. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son. And the Holy Spirit and, and teach them to be followers, to be my disciples. Disciple them. And make them ultimately, as we see, eventually come to fruition in Acts chapter 2, make them part of the church when you add them to the church. When you baptize them, they will be added to my church. I'll add them to my church when you baptize them. And then to go on to live faithful lives. Don't do what the, Hebrew, the, what the readers of Hebrews did, right? The, 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 the target audience of the gospel, of, uh, the, sorry, the, the letter to the Hebrews, that, uh, that they were drifting and they wanted to go away. Don't, don't leave that behind. Keep on trusting in me. I'm here. I'll be here for you. I'll be waiting in heaven for you. That's Christ's message. And if that's where you are this morning, maybe you've, you know, you've started that, that bookend has, that's already there for you, that, that hearing. Maybe you've heard some of that message already and, and you're getting to a point now where, uh, where you're ready to put on Christ and baptism. If, you're, if you are ready, please let us know this morning. Don't let this morning go by without making a decision for Christ. And if you are a Christian and maybe that faith has become a faith that's kind of shaky and you don't know why you believe what you believe. I know that there are guys here who, even when I'm gone, when I leave and go back to New Zealand, they have some wonderful information about, about why we believe what we believe. Why we believe what we believe. What's the ground for that? What's the reasons for that? And if that's something that you're struggling with, perhaps that struggle not only has led you to, to doubt your Christianity, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with doubting, nothing wrong with questioning, but maybe you've, you've, not even, you've not even looked for answers to that. And because you're struggling and because you're doubting, that's affected your faith. Your faith is not, no longer the kind of faith that really trusts God. And because you're not trusting God, you're not living the kind of life that you should be living. And if that's the case, you need to get back. You need to figure out a way to get back to Christ, to recover that trust that you have in Christ. And look, I'm here for another week. <laughs> and I'm here for another week, and Chris and I will be here. And if that's something you want to talk about, whether you want to talk about being a Christian, or if you want to talk about staying a Christian, we're here. And if you want to talk to us this week, we're happy to do that. But I know there are lots of very competent men and women sitting in this audience this morning who would love to help you out. Don't let that opportunity go. Begin your journey to faith today. Thank you.